Well, the pleasant good morning uh, to all of you. It is always uh, a pleasure when I can stand before you, God's people, and proclaim a portion of uh, his word. Um, Charles is right. Uh, the last time I was here was well over 20 years ago, and not only was I lighter then, I had hair. Uh, but that's what happens when you get older. Uh, but it is indeed a pleasure. I, uh, my wife and daughter are still, I have one daughter, a seven-year-old daughter, and they're still in Florida. We're thinking of uh, relocating back to this area. My grandmother is getting up there in age, and so is my mom, and um, they're not ready to leave California just yet. Uh, so those are things that my family and I are in the process of thinking about doing. Again, it is always a pleasure to worship with God's people. This is the greatest blessing aside from his son coming to this earth and dying for the sins of man. God giving us this kingdom is the greatest blessing that he could bestow upon all of mankind. We live in a beautiful country, but like anything else, we're divided. We're divided among class, among political lines. I was preaching in Mississippi a few years ago and one of the members there was saying that he went, he's from Northern Mississippi and he went to Southern Mississippi to get something and the lady said they don't serve Northerners. <laughs> they live in the same state, <laughs> right? But that's how life is, folks. But the beauty of the kingdom is that what divides us is removed. And so in God's kingdom, there is no black or white, rich or poor, north or south. There is no Republican or Democrat. You're just one in Christ. And you shouldn't allow things of the world to divide you because we are all one in Christ. We are bonded by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so when God looks upon his children, he sees one group, one people. And so that's the greatest blessing. There's nothing greater, folks, than being called a Christian. There is no greater joy when Nicodemus came to Jesus and asked Jesus how is it you know how can how can one be right with god and he says well unless one is born of the water and spirit he will by no means enter into the kingdom of heaven think about that folks when you are baptized and you come out of that water you are a new creature god has removed your sin it's a great blessing to be called a christian the next step higher it's Jesus, and he's not going to give up his seat anytime soon. And so the greatest thing that you can be called is a Christian. And so it is a blessing to be here. Thank you to the song leader for leading those songs and for all of you singing out. Thankful for the young brother that led the prayer. I appreciate any time somebody can petition my name before our father. I'm greatly appreciative of that. Grateful for the brother that led us in the Lord's Supper talk to remind us of the blessings that we have that was given to us and the free gift of salvation given to us by God and his son. Now we're going to spend the most of our time this morning in Luke 7 as the brother read for us. But before we go there in First Peter 5, Peter is admonishing the elders to be real elders. And again, I am grateful for the elders for giving me this, this opportunity. But he reminds the elders of their mission and what they are called to do. They are to shepherd the flock of God. They're not to be, they're not to lord their position over and, and abuse God's children, but they are to protect. God's flock. And that's what the elders do with you here, because they will have to give an account for God to God for how they 
shepherd his people. And he says, when you do that, the chief shepherd will give you an unfading crown of glory. And then he then turns to the young men and he reminds the young men because it is so easy when you are younger to not respect those who are older. And he reminds the young men to respect those who are in, in a position of authority, but not just that, but to respect all of those in the congregation that are older, treat them with respect. But then he ties it all in and he closes it all up, reminding both the young and old that they need to clothe themselves with humility. And so he says, for God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. That's found in Proverbs 3 and verse 34. Now, Peter paraphrases what is really found there. But he reminds us, beloved, of something very crucial. And that is that God loves humility. Humility is the one aspect that the Lord will not turn away. If you are humble, God will graciously and lovingly receive you. It is the proud and the arrogant that God rejects. Now, the question is why? Well, when you are proud and arrogant, you are your own God. There is no room for God. You have become your own God. And when you become your own God, you're not going to listen and you're not going to subject and submit yourself to God's will. And so God is going to reject you because God cannot work with you if you are filled with pride. But the humble, he's always willing to receive. You know, a humble person is a thankful person. A humble person is thankful when things are good. And a humble person is thankful even when things aren't good. They're always thankful. And I think there's a correlation there, beloved. The more thankful you are, the more humble you are. The more arrogant you are, the less thankful you are. And so as Christians, we must learn to be truly thankful in all situations. The apostle Paul was. He knew how to have, a, when he had an abundance, he knew how to operate and get along with that. When he didn't have any, he learned how to get along with that because his strength came from Christ. He was always an optimist. Humble people are always optimistic. You know, you can't humiliate a humble man because he's already there. A humble man won't push back. He won't resist. He will always want God's will to be done. And Jesus, when he gives his famous uh, sermon on the mount in Matthew 5, and you all are good Bible students, so you all know this in Matthew 5 and verse 3, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What Jesus is saying is the kingdom belongs to humble people. When you're humble, the kingdom belongs to you. Humble people are the only people that will want God's will to, be, to consistently be done. This reminds me of a story in Luke 5. Peter is out fishing with the rest of the fishermen, and I don't know how many of you fish. I don't like to fish. It's pretty boring. <clears throat> But at this time, this, these were how they, this, these men made their living. And so they go out and, and Luke tells us that they were washing their nets. So they didn't get anything. And so you could picture yourself in, in uh, put yourself in the minds of these fishermen. You're out all night fishing. You haven't caught anything. So that means you're not making any money. You're not providing for your family. And so Jesus gets into the one of the boats, which was Simon and asked him to put out a, uh, pull out a little way from the land. And he began teaching uh, the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Now, beloved, Simon's been fishing and he hadn't found anything. But Jesus tells him, put your nets back out. Simon answered and said, 
Master, we worked hard all night and caught nothing. But I will do as you say. Now that's a small story, but that statement should be the motto of every Christian. Lord, I don't understand, but I will do as you say. Peter was fishing all night, but I will do as you say. That's the mark of humility, beloved. Always doing God's will. When I moved to Florida, I would watch the news of California. And I would be amazed at some of the things that were happening here. And I would often say to my family, there is no way I would ever come back here to preach. There's no amount of money. There is no amount of nothing you could tell me. Can anything good come from California? Until I came back here. And I met two young men who were preaching the gospel in San Francisco. And it humbled me, beloved, because I realized that it doesn't matter where you go, as long as there are souls in that city and souls in that state, they are worthy to be saved. And so I got clouded by watching the news. And so I stopped watching it. Now, if you can watch the news and balance it with your love for God, then Praise be to God. I can't, so I had to pick one. But there are souls in this state that need saving. And as long as you have breath in your body, you need to do God's will. And so that was a really humbling experience for me meeting those men. And it just reminded me that I need to do better. When you help a humble man, he will thank you. He may give you a hug. He may give you a kiss. He will, but he will tell everyone, his friends and family, about what was done to him. And that is what we're supposed to do when we go out into the world. We are supposed to tell people of all of the good that God has done for us. We're supposed to tell everyone of God's kindness and mercy towards us. And now we get to our study in Romans 7. The brother read it for you in your hearing. I'm going to read it again in Luke 7, beginning in verse 1. When he had completed all his discourse, in the hearing of the people, he went to Capernaum. And a centurion slave who was highly regarded by him was sick and about to die. Well, this requires some of our attention here, folks. We're introduced to this Samaritan, so this, this centurion. And immediately when we're introduced to him, we see his character. This man has a slave, but he loves this slave. This slave is ill. And Luke tells us that he has a high regard. He cares very much for this slave. So that tells you, number one, at the very beginning about this man's character. Side note, in the New Testament, anytime you read about a centurion, it is always in a positive manner. There's a centurion in Mark after when Jesus dies, the centurion after the temple is torn in two, there's a great earthquake. The centurion says, surely this was the son of God. There is this centurion that we're about to read. There is also Cornelius in Acts 9. You remember him? He was a devout man, a good man that the Lord sends Peter to. So every time in the New Testament you read of a centurion, it is always in a positive manner. So when the centurion says, here's about Jesus, he sends some elders asking him to come and save the life of his slave. Now, this is worthy of our attention here too, beloved, because if you notice, the centurion doesn't demand, but he asks. And he sends Jewish elders to ask Jesus. Now, the centurion 
He could have exercised his power, but he doesn't do that. When they came to Jesus, these are the elders now, they earnestly implored him saying, he is worthy for you to grant this to him. Well, folks, this is something that you don't see in the New Testament, and that is Jews complimenting Gentiles, much less a centurion. The Jews, and y'all all know this because you're good Bible students, the Jews viewed Rome as Babylon because Rome was the imposing power over the Jews. If you were a Jew, like Matthew as a tax collector working for Rome, you were considered a traitor because no self-respecting Jew would dare work for Babylon. But here are these, here are these elders coming to Jesus and they not only tell him, hey, you should go help him. They say he is worthy for you to help him. But you don't see that. This is also a lesson that the worst insult or the best compliment you will ever receive is what people will say about you when you are not there. This man isn't there, but he gets the ultimate compliment from these elders. And they go on to explain why he is worthy for Jesus to perform this. For he, the elders continue, loves our nation, and it was he who built our synagogues. When centurions would go into an area, they always made it better than it was when they were, when, uh, before they got there. So centurions would often go in and they would run aqueduct so that place could have running water. And so here is this centurion who's not religious, he's not, he doesn't believe the, the God of the Jews, right? doesn't worship with them at least, but he builds them a synagogue. He doesn't have to do that. But the elders come and say, this man is worthy because he builds for us a place to worship. So when you use deductive reasoning, if he's building a place for them to worship, that means he's going to let them worship freely. Now, Jesus started out on his way with them. And when he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends saying, Lord, do not trouble yourself any further for I am not worthy for you to come under my roof. Now we need to stop there because there are some commentaries that uh, commentators that will tell you, well, he didn't want Jesus to come in because his house really wasn't very, very up to standards. Well, that's not true because Roman centurions were like upper middle class people today. So he had a nice home. So it wasn't that his home was in disarray that he didn't want the Lord to come in but he didn't feel worthy for Jesus to come into his roof. This is the son of God. And he didn't feel worthy. Do you see the humility in that? But then he goes on. He said, for this reason, I did not consider myself worthy to come to you, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. Now you want to talk about faith, beloved. This man said, Jesus, I don't need to see you perform miracles. He heard that Jesus performed miracles. He didn't see it. And he had enough faith to say, Lord, you just say the word. And I know he didn't say, I think, or I hope, or maybe he says, you say the word. And I know that you will heal my servant. Well, that's faith. For I am a man in verse eight placed under authority with soldiers under me and i say to this one go and he does it and another come and he comes and to my slave do this and he does it he recognizes jesus's authority he recognizes who jesus is the jews didn't this gentile does he says lord i know that you are in a position of authority just like me but unlike me, I cannot heal this man like you can. Verse nine, now when Jesus heard this, he marveled. There's not a lot that makes Jesus marvel in the New Testament, beloved. 
except faith. Charles, I'm going to pick on you because you're the one that I connected with. Charles, your Savior comes today. You would want him to come to your house. And he would come, Charles, because he's your Savior. And you'll show him pictures of your beautiful family. You'll show him pictures of you and your wife and the husband that you were and all of the things that you go. And he will come and he will watch all of that. But Charles, he will marvel at your faith. He will marvel at the father that you were, the husband. He will marvel at all of those things. Same thing with all of you. Brother, he will come to your house because he's your savior. And you will show him all of the accolades that you have, that you have accomplished throughout your life but he will marvel at your face. That's what makes Jesus happy. There's another time that Jesus marveled at someone's faith. And that is in Matthew 15, the Syrophoenician woman. You all know this story, but I'll read it again. It says, Jesus went on from there into the district of Tyre and Sidon. And a Canaanite woman from that region came out and began to cry out, saying, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is cruelly demon-possessed. And he did not answer her a word, and his disciples came and implored him, saying, Send her away, because she keeps shouting at us. But he answered and said, I, will, I was only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and began to bow before him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered, it is not good to take children's bread and throw it to dogs. You know, when brethren come and they have disagreements, and I don't try to, I don't try to downplay their disagreements, but I always ask them, hey, were you ever called a dog? How would you feel if Jesus called you a dog? Now, some of y'all have dogs that you take care of and you groom, but nobody wants to be called a dog. No one. But here is this Gentile woman. When she comes to Jesus, do you know what she calls him? Son of David. Jews never called Jesus son of David, but she recognizes his authority. Now, you would think Jesus would stop and go, wow, you know of me? Then I'm going to help you. But he ignores her. And so the disciples are like, how this woman is just embarrassing. We need to send her away. And then Jesus tells her, well, I was only sent to the, to the lost sheep of Israel. You need to help me, Lord. It's not good to take bread and give it to dogs. Now, if I were that woman, I can honestly tell you that I would have felt insulted. You're supposed to be the son of God and you're calling me a dog? But this woman taught me something. Because when Jesus says it, look at verse 27. But she said, yes, Lord, even the dogs feed on the crumbs which fall from the master's table. Lord, I don't want your bread. I'll just be happy with the crumbs. <laughs> How many of us would say that? This woman recognized who Jesus was. And I think Jesus was doing this to test her. Call her a dog. Let's see how she'll respond. Well, Lord, I don't need the bread. Just give me the crumbs that fall from the table, and I'll be satisfied with that. And he answered and said, uh, and Jesus said to her, O oh woman, your faith is great. You see how he marveled at that? I called you a dog. And you said, hey, as a dog, feed me the crumbs. You just give it. If it comes from your hand, I will gladly take it. Woman, your faith is great. You know what is sad, beloved? In that story and in this story and in uh, Luke 7, when Jesus sees this man's faith in verse 9, in the latter part, he said, he turned and said to the crowd that was following him, I say to you, not even in Israel have I found such great faith. Do you know where faith should have been found? Israel. You know why? They had the law. They had the prophets. And do you know what the law and prophets pointed to? 
Jesus, every single prophet would prophesy about destruction, but then they would talk about Zion. There will be a helper from Zion, uh, Isaiah would talk about. A root from the seed of Jesse would spring forth from Zion. The lion from the tribe of Judah will come forth from Zion, all pointing to who? Jesus. And when Jesus came, the people that should have accepted him, rejected him. This is one of the saddest statements that Jesus would ever say because his own people rejected him. Well, what about the church today? If Jesus were to come in the doors here at East Foothill, that's the name of the church, right? At Carter Avenue, they change it to Almaden Valley. And I always say Carter Avenue and they always correct me. So if I say it wrong, y'all can butcher me back in the back when I'm done. But if Jesus came to the East Foothill Church of Christ, what would he say about the faith in this building? I'm not here to condemn you, beloved. But it's just a reminder to all of us that you want the Lord to marvel at your faith. You understand? There's too much division in this world. Too much animosity and anger in this world that Christians, quite frankly, have no business getting involved in. I've had to preach at places where brethren would be divided among politics. They can't talk to each other because one's a Democrat and one's a Republican. One likes Trump and the other doesn't. And you're missing the whole point. Christians have allowed COVID to divide them. You are missing the whole point. Because the moment you do those things, you give Satan an opportunity. And what did Jesus say about Satan? He was a liar from the beginning. He got Adam and Eve, two people that God created, that walked with God, that knew God. He got them to disobey God. What, what do you think he will do to us? When we allow things of the world to divide us, man, you want to wear a mask, wear a mask. You tell me, hey, Justin, you got to come to my house, wear a mask. I will happily wear a mask because I'm not dying on a hill that's not worth dying over. Life is too short. And heaven is too precious. As we conclude in verse 10, those who had been sent, when those who had been sent returned to the house, they found a slave in good health. We don't have a record of Jesus saying anything to heal this woman or the slave. He must have said something or maybe he thought it, I don't know. But that slave was healed. The slave was healed because of this centurion's humility. Humility is what we must always possess. You don't ever want God to humble you. That is why God always says, humble what? Yourself. Because if God has to move to humble you, you're going to feel it. Trust me, folks. God has had to do that in my life. Because for years, I was filled with pride. I look down on people because of their faith. And God had to move to humble me. Shouldn't have had to do it. But I was too foolish. It's like Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel. Remember when Nebuchadnezzar walks out and he sees his kingdom? And he says, look at all the great, look at how great my kingdom is. And God came and said, you're going to be like an animal. Your hair is going to grow long. Your nails are going to grow long. And you're going to eat grass like a cow so that you will know that it is not you who have these kingdoms, but I bestow it on the lowest of men. And that's exactly what happened. Now, we get down on Nebuchadnezzar, but when Nebuchadnezzar returned, you know what he did? 
he recognized the true God. And that was the last time you heard of Nebuchadnezzar. So I don't know if he was saved or not. That's between him and God. But at least the last time we hear of Nebuchadnezzar, it humbled him to recognize the one true God. You see, you don't ever want God to humble you, beloved. What you want him to do is honor you and raise you up. Paul in Philippians 2 says, have this attitude in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of man, in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but humbled himself, taking the form of a bondservant, being humble until the point of death. For this reason, God has given him a name that has besto uh, bestowed upon him a name above all, all names by which every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Do you know what Paul is saying there? Jesus did not esteem himself. God did. You want to know why God did? He humbled himself to the point of death. Beloved, understand this. On the day of judgment, how many people are in this world? Eight billion? On the day of judgment, we don't know what it's going to be like. It's going to be maybe a day like this. Things are going to stop. And eight billion people, eight billion people will all bow. But on that day, beloved, there are going to be two kinds of bowing. The first kind of bowing are going to be for people who rejected God. A preacher friend of mine says on the day of judgment, there'll be no agnostic, there'll be no atheist. You will see God in all of his glory and you will bow. But those who rejected God, they will bow out of fear because their time on earth is done. And they are going to a place of eternal fire. I tell my nephews like this, you know, you can go out into a lake, Lake Alabama, where my mom lives. Picture you go out into that lake, take water out, and put fire in. When you go out into that lake, and in that fire, you hear people crying and moaning. That's the lake of fire. But there is no relief coming. You remember in the, the product, the left, uh, parable of the uh, rich man and Lazarus? When the rich man is in torment and he's begging Abraham, just take a tip of your finger and put water on my tongue. And Abraham says, I can do nothing for you. On that day, all of those who rejected Jesus, they will bow out of fear because it's over. The second kind of battle. It's what you, God's faithful few, will do. You will bow. But you will bow out of love. Because your Savior has come to take you home. You see, it's uh, in the book of Revelation, it's the sign of the marriage, the Jewish marriage. The husband and the wife, they, the groom and the bridegroom, they go, they come and they have the feast, and then they get separated. And at sundown, the groom would go to the bride's house, take the bride, and they would go to their home, and the marriage is complete. Our marriage, in the book of Revelation, when you read it, it talks about Christ as the bridegroom coming for his bride. Well, the marriage isn't yet complete because our bridegroom has not yet arrived. When our bridegroom arrives, he will take you, his people, and he will go back to heaven where he is from. Then the marriage will be complete. You will be with your Savior, and he will be with you. You will see him in all of his glory. And Charles, I'm going to pick on you again. Before you can say it, Charles, he will say, Charles, I loved you before you were here. Welcome home. That will be reserved for you. You will bow out of adoration because your Savior is here. You want that? Stay humble. Be thankful to God. I love you, brother. Now, some of you may say, well, Justin, just that. Just, yes. I wasn't even born when you were here 20 years ago. How can you say it? Well, I can say it because as a Christian, love is not an emotion, it's a way of love. So I love you. Because you are bonded with the blood of Christ. You are my brothers and sisters in Christ. And I want to see you in heaven. Now, I don't know, folks, 
I can't promise tomorrow. I don't know if I'll ever see you again, but I hope to see you on the other side. You look around this community, there are people looking because they are lost. Let them find God. There are people looking for love because they're lost. Let them find love here. Let them find faith here. Let them find hope here. Because where God's people are, faith, hope, and love should be. When that new preacher comes, Work with him. Encourage him. Don't put all the work on him. You work with him. And together you can do wonderful things for this community. Because as long as you are breathing, you are useful to God. You understand? Remain humble. You wait patiently for your sin. If you're not a Christian, you desire to become. I will not leave here without extending to you the Lord's invitation. God wants you in heaven. Hell was not created for you. Hell was created for Satan and his ending. God doesn't want anyone to go to hell. If you don't believe me, read Ezekiel 18. God doesn't take pleasure when anyone dies in sin. Rather, they repent and live. That's what God wants. If as a Christian, you are struggling with anything, then you let the brother in here know. If our, when our brother leaves us, if it's something that you can take care of with you and your God, then you do it. As he's leading us in song, but if you need encouragement of your brothers and sisters here, then let them know. If they will do them the greatest honor to hold your name up in prayer. Don't deny your brothers and sisters the honor to serve. We can encourage you anyway to come to stand. And as he said.